And so now we're going to move into panel two, which really looks at organizations and you know the, the values, ethics, and tech, and also now analytics and organizations today. So very excited to have this panel up. And so I would like to call up our one of our fearless leaders and associate dean and professor Larry Calbers as our moderator. Come on up. Thanks, Nola. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm Larry Calbers. I am Associate Dean of the College of Business and also a Professor of Accounting and the R. Chad Dreyer Chair of Accounting Ethics. So I think a, a lot about ethics stuff in business and technology, so I was asked to do this panel and I'm, I'm really looking forward. I always have a couple things that I think I can add, but for the most part when I'm on these kinds of things, I, I'm here to learn just like you are, to learn from these panelists. I think one of the exciting things that we've been doing with the College of Business and a lot of the uh, colleges and schools at LMU are doing is to partner with industry partners and we can get that relationship going which uh, encourages all of us to think more deeply and more often about these topics and for all of us to learn and for our students to really benefit from these relationships. And as the last uh, panel talked about also, Jobs, right? Jobs are kind of important as well. So all of those kind of go together and our mission and values is at the heart of, of all of that as well. So this group, uh, we have some questions that we've talked a little bit about. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit of a free for all and so I think it's going to be enjoyable. We are going to talk about uh, tech and business and ethics and values. And so I'd like our panelists to come up and sit down up here and grab a, a microphone and bring their beverage if they want to. And so what I would like to do is just briefly introduce each of them and then let each of them, and I'll, I'll call them by name, to just tell us a little bit about themselves, their career path, and what they're doing now, and then I'll, I'll have a seat and we'll talk about our uh, topics of today. Uh, so we have Chris Stern, Managing Director from Trimble Ventures, on that, that end. Nima Dadakamiku, Product Manager at Google, and Samjita Mitra, Chief Economist for the California Department of Finance. So one thing we've also been uh, engaged in is this idea that there's a tri-sector solution for many of our problems on Earth and in the United States, which is, what are, what are the tri-sectors? Business, government, and NGOs, that is non-for-profit, not-for-profit organizations. So let's start with Chris. Chris, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I was sitting in your seat a long time ago. Um, I'm Chris Stern. Uh, I graduated from LMU in 1993. Um, it's a long time ago. I'm currently with Trimble, but um, kind of had an interesting run after that. So I was LMU, then I was UCLA for grad school, um, and then you know sort of worked for the city of LA for a number of years um, as an intern here. So I was getting an internship on that last panel. I agree, that's the right way to go to get a job and figure out what you actually do in life after uh, school. And then from there, I went and did startups. So now I'll tell you a little bit about the Trimble Venture Fund. So I did a few startups. I, I was intrigued with, with starting companies. Um, I guess the milestone for me was, was starting and selling two companies by the time I was you know, kind of 30 is what my target was. I was close. I missed it by a few months. Um, but I was in the startup world, and then I sold my company to a company called Trimble. So I'm with Trimble Navigation, which is now rebranded Trimble Inc. Um, it's kind of an interesting story in a company, but my role is managing our venture fund. So uh, we have a $200 million fund. We invest in startups, mostly early stage companies in our markets um, where Trimble plays. So if you, um, you know, if you look at sort of what is Trimble, Trimble started as a GPS company when you're driving around the streets here um, and you see people with yellow tripods blocking traffic and all that stuff, that's, that's Trimble technology. That's where it started. Um, so it's a GPS company, started the Department of Defense, created the GPS system, early pioneer in GPS, and then over time, uh, we've grown. So we've grown into all sorts of technology. We've acquired close to 200 companies. We're a global business. Uh, we're about $3.6 billion. We have 12,000 employees. We're in 130 countries. 
Um, the venture fund is brand new. We launched the fund in August of last year. So we've made one investment. We're a limited partner uh, in a, a venture fund that invests in multiple companies. Our core industries, which is interesting for this conversation, um, it's, it's sort of an industrial company moving into software and technology over time. That's what's happened. Um, so what you, you look at Trimble and you, you can say we're in four big industries that are basically touching all parts of life. There's construction, transportation, agriculture is the big, and then geospatial, which is all 3D. You talk about the metasphere, data collection, all that kind of stuff. So uh, you, know, you can look at that, but in terms of my path, it's been a series of kind of learning uh, some business experience, startup experience, uh, you know, raising money, selling companies, then on the Trimble side, buying a whole bunch of companies, and then now on the venture capital side. So uh, good to be here. I have two other roles. We have an education outreach program, so we actually have put a whole bunch of Trimble Tech in Seaver College. Um, we have a Trimble Technology Lab there with latest 3D technology scanning, all that kind of stuff, software for uh, construction, structural design. And then I'm on the board of what we call the Trimble Foundation Fund. So that's our philanthropic arm. We invest in initiatives for disaster and climate resilience, female education empowerment, uh, and diversity, equity, inclusion. We've been uh, running that fund for about four years now. So uh, good to be with you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Nima? Hi, everyone. Uh, Nima uh, I'm currently a product manager for Vertex AI at Google. Uh, that's their flagship AI platform. Uh, but I just got that job about a few months ago, so still a Noogler. Uh, and also, I believe uh, all my opinions are my, my own and not of Google, so hopefully they won't fire me. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, uh, in terms of uh, my career, it might make sense to go cr uh, chronologically. So I actually got my degree at Berkeley. I did math, physics, and computer science. And then I went to Boeing, where I was a software developer. Uh, stayed there about six or seven years, got sick and tired of that big company vibe, um, and came to Anderson to get my MBA and do startups. Uh, and after Anderson, I spent about five years doing startups around um, subjective intelligence uh, and home care. Uh, and then after that, uh, about three, three and a half years ago, I joined XPRIZE, which is a nonprofit uh, that does grand challenges. Uh, and uh, as a director of AI, I ran the AI X Prize, which was a $5 million competition sponsored by IBM uh, that asked teams from all around the world to use AI for good. Uh, it was a really cool and fun experience. Um, before the pandemic, I would literally fly around the world and meet these teams and work with them to drive uh, change. Uh, and you know, there's really cool technology, everything from beekeeping to uh, using the, the sound of infants crying to detect uh, whether they're ill or not. Um, education, uh, you know, uh, clean tech, uh, anything you can name, there was probably a, a, a team kind of competing in that area. Uh, and then once I finished that about uh, a few months ago, I uh, went to Google where I, I am now. So, yeah. And then Sumjita. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanjita Mitra, and uh, currently I'm the chief economist at the California Department of Finance. So I'm the chief economist for the state, a little bit of a different path than my panelists here. Uh, I went to undergrad at UCLA, and I did my uh, bachelor's in economics and political science. Then I did my master's and PhD at the Claremont Graduate University. And I've kind of taken that tri-sector approach that Larry talked about. I first started working in a business at a litigation consulting firm. Then I moved into the nonprofit world at the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. And then I moved into the state um, to be the chief economist and arguably the most interesting time that anyone will ever see in our lifetimes, hopefully. Um, and so the reason I'm excited to be here is I really have been working on um, kind of creating those relationships between government and business to kind of work together to um, solve some of the big problems that our state has. And if any of you are interested, um, the state has internships that they're listed at calhr.ca.gov. And it's for people um, really who are you know, amazing um, thinkers and problem solvers and kind of working at the state. Um, so I do encourage you to look at that. Um, Anna Vandana has my contact information. If you have any questions about it, you want to talk to somebody who works for the state, I'm happy to um, have some conversations with you uh, because we are always looking for the 
best and brightest minds, so I do encourage um, all of you to um, reach out. So thank you. Thanks so much. So we do have some questions, but as I say, we're, we're just going to go all over the place as, as uh, our topics take us. So one thing that we, did, we, we met a, a couple days ago just to brainstorm a little, and we were talking a lot about AI. So let's start with a little bit about AI. So which industries or types of businesses are really making use of that now, and where do you see it, that increasing over the next five to 10 years? And I'm going to let this panel just jump in, and, but as a teacher, I can call on you if I need well, to. I'll give you the, the sort of high level, because the numbers are interesting. Like, so let's talk about um, thought capital flows. Where's money flowing, right, into AI? Because you asked this question, and I was sort of interested in the answer, because um, AI is, is just on everyone's you know, pitch deck when they have a company. Everything's an AI company, at least for the last few years, and continues. So. You know, it's a $145 billion industry as of 2021. Um, I don't know if you want to put that in perspective. Now, Trimble, I did put it in perspective. So we're a company that looks at four markets, and, and each of them are trillion-dollar markets. Construction's a trillion-dollar market. Transportation, trillion-dollar markets. <clears throat> so you have a $145 billion piece of technology that touches multiple markets, 145 growing up to, I think it was 280 by 2024. So it's growing. It's interesting. Um, and it touches multiple industries, and you have to sort of peel that back is, is what does it touch. Um, the other thing that's uh, interesting is, is when you look at the industries it touches and you look at kind of the market studies, it breaks it into four categories. It says core, kind of core AI tech, which is sort of the, the software, the engines that drive it. Semiconductor, so at the edge, you know, on chips. I'm looking to Nima because he'll explain all this to me. And then the third piece and the fourth are interesting to me because um, it's vertical markets. It's indus industrial applications in vertical markets. And then the other one that's real interesting to me is autonomous and robotics, right? So that gets interesting to talk about AI and robots. So of those two, okay, of those two markets, vertical and robotics, that's 70% of the AI market. So 70% is not core, it's not semiconductor, it's in applications in industry. Think about that. How does it solve a problem? Um, and then you go to those industries, and then you can see that um, the big guys, it kind of inverts. It's, co it's consumer, it's financial, it's healthcare, and kind of ERP and IT take up like 80% of that, that kind of vertical piece. And then there's the two that I'm interested in, which are 20%, which is transportation and core industrial technologies. Because I always ask the question uh, when I was thinking about this with Trimble is, you know, will AI help me uh, build that building or build a home? Um, and that's a fun question to think about. Better. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. How many people here know the difference between AI and machine learning? All right, a few. Does someone want to answer it or give an answer? That was a pretty good, pretty good answer. Um, yeah, the reason AI isn't in every pitch deck is because AI just means you know machines doing things, right? Like uh, it, it, any any uh, any time that uh, you get a a system, an algorithm, whatever to mimic humans, it's AI. So AI isn't everything. Also, I saw a study that showed uh, startups that had AI in their name were like 20% higher valuation. So that's probably another reason. <laughs> Um, but yeah, when you, get, when you get to machine learning, that's where you need data and it's statistic. It's, it's, it's a statistical pattern recognition. It actually doesn't have to be labeled data. You can also do some statistical stuff with non-labeled data as well. But, but yeah, labeled data definitely helps. Um, and yeah, so it's a subset. But this is where your question about different uh, industries comes into play. Uh, whenever you're dealing with data, you most likely will have AI, right? So. Uh, healthcare, right? You have all those enterprise health records, and you're like, "Ooh, AI! We're gonna we're gonna solve healthcare." 
turns out the data in healthcare is pretty crappy. Like the formatting is off, it's, it's inconsistent, uh, doctors don't fill out the records. So, you know, it, it's much more difficult. Now with, a, for example, autonomous vehicles, right? You just record that video and you train on it. And that is an area where you, you have probably, it's a little bit easier, but it's still difficult, right? Because, you know, with autonomous vehicles, 99% of the time, it works perfectly, right? But what about that kid with kicking the ball and running across? For humans, we're really good at like understanding that that momentary like what the heck is happening. But machines need to have seen that or understand that through pattern recognition. So you have to basically find those edge cases and then train on a ton of those edge cases. So AI has been this interesting journey of you know starting with the simple and the easiest you know image recognition images are easy to obtain and we can train on that and it's been getting more and more complicated and more and more into niche applications as well. Um, when I mentioned, for example, infants crying, uh, it turns out children have uh, you know babies have different uh, vocal sounds when they're sick, when they have pneumonia or something when they're they're infants. So if you collect that data, then you can train a system on that, right? But who's going to go out of their way to collect the sounds of infants crying and also to, to the labeled data point, infants who are sick, who are crying, who sound different than normal infants who are crying. And then also, do infants sound the same around the world, right? Like, does an infant in Africa sound the same as an infant in Montreal, right? So this is how you can see where AI can be applied to almost anything, but the promise is different than the actual application. Great. Sumjan, I'm going to ask you to answer it in maybe a little different way, and you probably needed to anyway. So from your perspective from the state, uh, what, what kinds of things actually might they be using AI for, but then also in terms of the industries and the kind of investment that the government might want to be making, how are you thinking of that? Sorry, hello. Uh, um, so, you know, right after the recession, California lost <clears throat> 2.7 million jobs. And it was the worst recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And, you know, and then our GDP contracted 30%. And as soon as, just as quickly as we had shut everything down, um, once things started opening back up, things snapped back. So California's GDP recovered um, by the first quarter of 2021, just three quarters later. Meanwhile, we still have over a million people who are not um, working right now. Either they're unemployed or they've left the labor force. So our output and our production, due in part to AI, has um, you know, let our GDP um, go back to normal. So we still have roles for people that are not being filled. And th that's where I think the opportunity is in terms of how can we translate all that brain power into um, doing some of the other work, some of that um, forward thinking that the state needs. And so in terms of you know, uh, the industries, I think some of the, the biggest ones would be um, in government. Um, what can we do, for example, AI for good? You know, California now has moved beyond a wildfire season to a wildfire year. So, can AI be used to identify areas of the state perhaps we don't build there, perhaps we don't um, have houses or businesses there to kind of, you know, those are the most likely places. Are there areas of the state that are less susceptible so that we should maybe think about moving communities? Not that easy, but let's think about it. But we also hit up against climate change on the other side. We live like a large coastline. So we're kind of trapped between wildfires and a rising sea level. So, you know, can AI be used to solve the problems? And the government, with, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, prejudices against it, but they are open to thinking about, you know, some ways to solve these problems. So if, you know, somebody comes and says, you know, this is how we're going to fix this, it's great. What if AI can be used? We have a chronic water shortage. That's only going to get worse. We're entering the third year of a severe drought. Can AI be used to identify water sources or uh, preserve water in some areas that we haven't tapped into? Um, maybe we can look into AI to change the seasons a little bit so we, we can wa draw water from other places. So in terms of thinking of big picture solutions for the state, I think AI plays a great role. 
Um, in terms of industries, I think AI can be used. We're seeing some transformation in industries um, from COVID. Um, leisure and hospitality um, saw half of its workers um, lose their jobs right when COVID hit. And even now, it's been changing. We're not, um, that industry isn't returning its workforce just as fast because we've changed. Now we have um, robots at restaurants taking your order. Um, you don't maybe need a wait waiter or waitress anymore. Um, you know, we have drones delivering your food. You're not going to the restaurants anymore. So there's a huge workforce that there's a potential there. So identifying the people in that workforce and what else, what other opportunities can we create for them? Like Nima mentioned healthcare. Our population is growing and aging. And um, you know, the jobs unfortunately in healthcare that people can take are those in-home healthcare workers that pay you about less than $20,000 a year. Considering our average income in California is about $82,000, you see how significantly less paid they are and how this is creating inequality in this state. Can AI be used to um, you know, narrow that gap a little bit more? So that's what I think, you know, identifying these problems, which I think you're all aware of, and how AI can be used to be part of the solution, to be part of solving these problems. Great, thank you. So um, I want to talk about some very important things, but I was, I was just thinking about Nemo. So if you're a, a new parent and have a baby, Maybe there's nothing more important than figuring out why the baby's crying. So, you know, <laughs> that has a lot of importance. But I think also your point that you have to have the right examples in, in uh, calculating these things, whether you're driving a, a car or whether you have a baby. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about some stories or anecdotes where, you know, technology has some problems because it didn't recognize some of these issues, and, and some of these would be DEI issues as well. Absolutely. Uh, the you know, Silicon Valley motto, the Bay Area motto is, you know, move fast and break things. That doesn't really work when you're dealing with artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and they've done that and caused harm. So uh, just a few examples of that. Um, you know, our, our friends over at Amazon uh, started using a... Uh, they were like, look, humans are biased, which they are. Uh, we're going to use AI to screen for uh, resumes. And they, they tried it, and it turned out to be really sexist. And it was like, why? Well, apparently, the, the, the data that they were training on would uh, identify men with specific keywords and would rank them higher in the algorithm. So the, system, so the, the programmer wasn't you know, sexist but the original data that was trained on had some underlying sexism to it. Uh, another example, there was a, a case where they were using, uh, they were using data, uh, geographic data to do lending. And they looked at the results and it turned out to be discriminatory. And you're like, they were like, wait a minute, we've never, like there is no, there is no uh, you know, like racial component in this data set at all. What's going on? Turns out zip codes are highly attuned to, uh, to your uh, uh, demographics, right? So, so you know, African Americans live in specific areas and you know, uh, Caucasians li live in so forth. And when you train on that and then you train on the historical data that is discriminatory towards lending, you end up with, with those, those problems. And then the last case uh, where they, for example, uh, re they're like, look, Judges can be biased in the way that they uh, assign parole. So we're going to use data and train on that and have a recommendation system on parole decisions. Uh, they went through that whole process, and it turned out to be racist again. And they're like, what is going on? Uh, they, turns out the system would actually make recommendations that were, that were uh, good, but the judge, because they had a human in the loop, which you want to do, right? You want to have a human review the system just to make sure it's OK. The judge would overrule. Uh, when it was dealing with, uh, you know, white defendants, but it, they would not overrule when it was dealing with African-American defendants. So the human was, was injecting a little bit of racism into the system. So now these are all negative examples, but the question is then, is AI bad? No, it's, the difficulties come into play when we are not using representative data, when we are not putting in the safeguards, when we are not thinking holistically about this, the way it's designed. Problems can show up in the data, uh, for example, if you want to train, if you want to detect a wedding dress, right? If you're like, I'm going to grab pictures off the internet and I'm going to train a wedding, uh, train a wedding dress detection system. 
If you only use pictures from Western parts of the world, it's going to be a white dress, right, like your traditional you know, dress. But if you look at uh, Indian weddings, uh, they're much more colorful. The system will not be able to detect that, right? So you need a representative data set from wherever you're working, uh, wherever your system needs to be deployed. Uh, and then you also need to understand, is your team, that the people working on it, are they representative? Because if there's not someone in the room, like a, you know, a woman or a minority or someone who is not that stereotypical you know, programmer bro from, from the Bay Area, they will not think about the shortcomings that the system has. Uh, my favorite joke around this is, uh, think about all the great startups that came out of the Bay Area. They're all designed to replace your mom, right? food delivery, laundry service, right, taxis. So, so, and the reason that happens is because it's probably a bunch of 18-year-old, you know, guys being like, I'm gonna come up with the problem I know the best, right? Um, so I can go on forever. But the point I'm making here is if you don't have representation in your, your development of the system, you won't know you have those biases. You won't know you have those shortcomings, uh, both in the data and in the way the system is designed. So to get good, high-performing, representative AI systems and algorithms that actually work for everyone, you have to think through that process. You can't, you can't move fast and break things. You have to actually be cognizant of the end results and how you're designing your systems. So Nima, how do we solve that issue? I mean, how, who is responsible and accountable for making sure that these systems start moving towards being more representative? It's, it's, it's not just one person. Um, it's, for example, if you're a product manager, you're responsible, right? If you're an engineer, you're responsible. If you're a customer, you're responsible. We have to all work together as a society to demand that our systems are better representative of all of us, right? Um, and, and again, this is not just a, you know, like let's be good for goodness sake proposition. Uh, better performing systems, systems that are ethical, systems that use um, AI principles and, and ethics, actually drive better results, right? It makes sense, right? It works for more customers and it makes more money. And you can deploy it to other parts of the world and you know, gain customers. Uh, so this kind of thinking you know, improves the bottom line, right? It's the triple bottom line concept. It, 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 you know, it performs better, it makes you more money, and it, you know, everyone feels happy and better, and, and you know, society is actually in a better place once you do it. So, again, like, this is not something where you're like, my engineer has to figure this out. If you're like a business student, or if you're an engineer, you're like, look, my, my product manager, or my project manager, or whoever will figure this out. It's up to everyone to kind of think through that process uh, and there are different guidelines, you know, Google has them and Facebook has them and uh, there, are, there are different frameworks and uh, uh, guides and checklists put in place to kind of work, work through these processes like, you know, is your data representative, right? Uh, who are you actually inter interfacing with with your system? Have you tested it? Have you actually run through those? Are they, were they part of the design process? So, so, you know, it's everyone's kind of responsibility. Thanks. Uh, Chris, I wanted to ask you, I'm going to work from kind of general to more specific. So in terms of part, part of what you do is, or your firm is investing, right, Brenter? So ESNG has been very popular in terms of investment. Uh, we've had some of our faculty even doing research that when these firms are identified as ESNG, that those measures are not very good. Uh, and so there's also an issue. So what, what metrics are we using? Uh, there's been a lot of consolidation of these measures. The SEC now has just come out that they're going to come out with climate risk that's going to be required. And then, uh, so I'd, I'd like you to kind of just walk through that a little bit from your point of view, but then maybe specifically about ag agriculture. What's going on in terms of technology? And of course, agriculture would be uh, subject to droughts, wildfires, climate change, all kinds of things specifically. So <clears throat> any, any one of those you want to take and kind of run with? Well, I'll, I'll touch on um, all of it. I, I think I can give you a perspective on the investing side. So we had a really interesting uh, presentation. So ESG, obviously, is a, is a popular term. It's been around a while. Um, you tend to hear a lot about sustainability, but, but broadly speaking, ESG as a concept. One of the uh, big funds who's an investor in Trimble, one of our big shareholders, gave an interesting presentation. And, and I like the concept because historically, um, he said, we look at ESG as a risk. So, so, so the metric is risk, historically, is what's your risk? So if you're building something that you might spill oil in your supply chain or something, they're looking at ESG in terms of the risk 
in terms of your stock valuation for investors historically. And I think the shift is now to what is the opportunity. And so that's the mindset shift. And so what you're asking about is, you know, what are the metrics? Well, <clears throat> that comes down to science-based targets. That's evolving. There are metrics. Um, most companies out there have ranked this as their top priority. Uh, and so what does that mean? What, what, what it means is it's not a risk factor anymore. It's not something that you just look at, um, you know, kind of with that half of the glass. It's the glass half full, glass half M. The opportunity is enormous, and I think people have realized that with the UN SDGs. I think what was missing was somewhat of a common framework because, you know, what is ESG to someone? Um, and then when you boil it down and you get to, and I think this is what the AI conversation was about, what are the requirements for that AI? What can you articulate what you want it to do? Um, and so the SDGs provide a framework and say, how do we have an impact in certain areas? Um, so we do that, you know, Trimble, it's, it's a huge deal for us. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about some of the startups and interesting capital flows. So back in, um, I wanna say 20, uh, geez, what was the year? Cli called Climate Tech 1.0. Um, and, and so Kleiner Perkins created a green fund. It was a billion dollar green fund. You guys all heard of Al Gore. Al Gore was up there. You know, I was with a startup that we were trying to help them raise money. And he walks behind the conference room door. The guys, you know, they freeze. They don't know what to do. Um, but he was a partner. Now he's at Generation Capital. These, have, these were like interesting concepts back then, but there was no buyers. There was no market for this. So dollars went in and then they fizzled and everyone went back to investing in internet companies. And, um, and they made a lot of money doing that. But now this next generation, there's actually real markets. So solar, wind, you know, clean tech, clean energy environment, the water challenge. We have all those businesses. We, of the 200 businesses we've acquired, you mentioned, and I was joking earlier, but you mentioned like uh, water challenges. And, and my background here, I studied civil engineering, environmental engineering, you know, environment and, and caring for our environment was something I learned at LMU. This isn't like a new concept, ESG. Um, so we try and do that, and in the water space, what's interesting is there are satellite-based AI companies, and they've been around. We bought a company in 2010 um, that was uh, analyzing satellite-based imagery to interpret data for the ground. All sorts of things, stormwater, all this kind of stuff. But now there's been a bunch of startups who've identified leakage, which is 30% of the world's water is lost by just leakage, right? That's a waste, and so when you have a drought, you can't afford to do that. And so we've looked at a bunch of satellite companies doing that. There are other satellite companies applying AI tech to identify risk in power lines which cause wildfires. They're one of the biggest risks is caused by seeing PG&E. So um, I think from an investor viewpoint, there is an enormous opportunity, tons of money going into it. And then you mentioned ag, well, yeah, ag and water. Um, and I joked about like building a house. Can AI build a house? I was, I was joking. But it kind of is starting to do that. So we've looked at startups that are doing what they call generative design. So if you take a class in you know, AutoCAD or something, how to design, well, there's startups that actually can, if this building, you said you want to develop this site, they'll just do a bunch of generative designs and they'll design a bunch of buildings for you that meet a good portion of your requirements, take out a ton of cost, ton of time, uh, a ton of benefits. So you're getting to the point where AI can actually build things for you. You can design things. And I say build things because we also are an indirectly invested in a company called Icon. Um, and I definitely say take a look at it. It's really cool. It's down in Texas. Um, a Tiger Global just did a big round, $185 billion. They're like a $2 billion valuation. Um, they 3D print homes. So that design, um, you know, AI-based design can then be, and it's like a huge printer. It looks like you see these printers that go back and forth. It's printing a house. So they've created a printer to print homes, and they're going to take that up to, um, to Mars. To, to, they're going to start looking at, at space development with this technology. It's impactful. And then last two days, I was at the Ag Tech conference. So you mentioned Ag Tech, which was interesting. And if you sit back and you go to an Ag Tech conference, what will strike you is, you know, you say ESG again. It, it's not like a small or a medium-sized challenge. For, for farmers, it is the challenge. Mother Nature is the challenge. And droughts, climate, all those kinds of things are beyond, you know, small issues. And in California, like we talked about, the droughts, the fires, these were farmers in the Napa Valley region. The fires destroyed crop, destroyed income. Um, you know, so it's, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's life, you know, and, it, and it's critical. And I say that pretty much every company we look at 
Um, I will be, you know, an AI company. I still look at, okay, what problem are you solving and why does it matter? And the why is an ESG why. It's those UN SDGs and, um, you know, what impact is it going to make on the future of this planet, the future of the workers and the workforce, and, you know, how is it going to make this better? We talk about this conference, it's like, I was saying this is the industrial transformation. Well, we went 1.0, 2.0, 3.4. Every one of those transformations makes life better, is supposed to make life better, did make life better. Um, but we talk about industry, you know, this 4.0, we're talking about industry 5.0 characterizing as sustainability, using data, using AI, using tools, technologies, robotics to actually make um, the changes that are needed to have the sustainability that we need going forward. So that's my long answer with a lot of uh, detail there, hopefully covered what you were looking for. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I know Samjita has to leave shortly. Do you have one minute to answer? It, yeah. yeah, so we're, we're going to ask the other panelists, but I know from your perspective that the digital divide is an important issue for the state of California and, and nationally. So if you could just give us a couple of things about maybe what you might be thinking about in that, and then we'll get some answers from our panelists. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, I think this, the state is really concerned with um, equity and especially equity of opportunity uh, for all Californians. Uh, we, have a st we have the highest poverty rate in the, in the country. Um, we, we're the largest state, but, in, you know, um, about 17% of our population is under the poverty line. And most of those are um, single moms with children most of those households. So it's, a, um, and you know, access to internet, we saw how critical it was, especially during COVID, where we don't, you know, the, the high income earners, the ones whose work is really easily translatable to telework, we didn't really feel it as much. Um, other people, if they had small children and their children relied on, um, you know, uh, school meals and access to internet at school, Fine, but at home, if, or if you're in a family that shares one computer and you have three kids, you know, trying to, um, to go to school all at the same time, what do you do? And, you know, one of the challenges of, for the state is in these last two years, kids lost f several years worth of education just in those two years. Um, and that's, you know, an educated workforce educated population, that's, that benefits all of us in the future. Um, and so, you know, access, um, the, creating the infrastructure for internet all over the state is an issue. Um, it doesn't come cheap, it's not easy to do. Um, you know, so I also encourage people, if, even if you're not working for the state, even if you're not working for your local government, um, you know, to be involved in local politics, uh, state politics, um, not just from a political perspective, but from, a communal perspective, you know, you might think, oh, I have my house, um, you know, and I have my retirement plan, why do I care about my neighbor? But in reality, we're all in this together. And so if you're, you know, and sometimes your state um, legislators or your city councils, they don't hear from people who um, are thinking beyond. They only think about, hear from people who may not always have the best interests of the broader society. So I do encourage you know, people to get involved. If you have a solution, um, you know, how to increase, improve access to in, um, internet, how to improve um, access to cheap cell service for people. It's no longer a luxury good, you know, it's, it's a necessity. The internet is no longer considered a luxury. And how do we implement that? People are already living paycheck to paycheck. Um, can they even afford that $40 a month for basic cab uh, cable internet, no, um, and it's, it's so I think you know it, the state's also trying to think about housing, you know, and one of the issues is you know our housing is we have a critical housing shortage, and part of it is driven by our local housing laws, and um, so you know we think about people who are able to afford to live in California and work in California and benefit California, and. To do that, you need to be able to afford to live here. And um, home prices during this last two, um, over the last two years, exceeded $800,000 last year for over seven months of the year. Um, considering that our average income is about 80,000, it really upends that three to one rule, rule of thumb that people have in other states about what you can afford to buy 
for a home in. And that just makes things like life a lot harder. So how can we, the states involved in those kind of day-to-day, -day, access to childcare, um, women who are parents who have to work in, in person, they can't work from their debt, they have to go into work, but who's gonna take care of their kids or at home because COVID has shut down the schools? Or, or their regular caretakers sick? Transportation, like Chris mentioned, um, you know, we, the state has a goal by 2035 to only sell um, uh, zero emissions vehicles in California, which is great, which is what we need for our climate goals. But those cars right now aren't cheap. And even if we could make them really cheap for people, we don't have the infrastructure in place for the charging stations um, and apartment buildings so that people could even afford, even if they could afford to buy it, which is, I think the, the cheapest Tesla or something is like $25,000, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you are already low income, that's a lot of money. And, and even if you could buy it, where are you gonna charge it? And so I think, there's a lot of problems, digital, transportation, childcare, healthcare. It's kind of overwhelming, but it's also very exciting to be involved in part of the solution. Like, and I encourage all of you, instead of just you know, shrugging or saying, oh, it's bigger than me, I can't do anything about it. Like, every one of us can be part of the solution, and I do encourage all of you to think about how you can help, and I think just attending Loyola, attending the symposium, talking to my panelists, I think you're already, that mindset's already there, and I encourage you to keep um, growing. Like I said, um, uh, Vandana Anna has my contact information. I'm happy to talk to any of you at any time, um, and maybe if I can, put you in touch with some other people to continue these conversations. So I apologize, I have to leave early, but this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Abdullah. So as Samjita points out, the digital divide is really a symptom of a bigger problem, which is inequality, and inequality in so many ways. And so uh, for our remaining panelists here on this particular question, what do you, what do you think are some things that technology can, can do or business can do? Of course, business can invest in certain things, but in terms of technology, I mean, I'm just thinking of Chris's idea of, of how we build homes, because uh, the price of homes <laughs> is rather dramatic. In California, it's not so much the, the price of actually building the homes, it's the land, uh, it's the regulations and other things, but just wonder what kind of thoughts that, that y'all had on both digital divide, but also just all these underlying issues and how technology and or business can help to solve some of those issues. Uh, the, uh, what I've seen is, uh, if you can go into the communities that are underrepresented and actually collect data and build solutions with them, you can lead to significant change. Um, for, for example, again, uh, another one of the AIX Prize teams, they were doing infant biometrics. So what that means is they were uh, working in Mozambique and they had a, an edge device AI system, basically like on an iPad or a phone and it would use infants, like the shape of their ear, the shape of uh, their paw print or their footprint, and it would create a, uh, essentially an ID card off of that information. Now, in those parts of the world, they don't have birth records. So if you want to vaccinate people, you don't have a birth record, you can't keep track of who's who, and you're like, well, surely their family will keep track of it. A lot of those families, a lot of those villages are communal, so they wouldn't know, who's, you know which parent is bringing in which child. So the point is, Someone went into those areas, gathered the data, trained on that data, and then was able to deploy it uh, to improve, significantly improve their lives. Now, do you have to go to Mozambique to do that? No. Uh, think about, uh, there are uh, areas here where people are not using, or not going into those places because they're not, you know, again, they're, they're, it's not the Bay Area, right? It, it's, you know, it's Arkansas, it's, you know, it's maybe it's the Valley or, or you know, uh, Central Valley here. Those, those, those communities that are less represented and less visited, right? And you can actually use AI, again, AI and ML are tools and they're mature tools that, like, you can use auto ML to basically train, like, you don't really, it's, it's almost point and click at this point. The data is the hard part. The engagement is the hard part. So if you can actually 
think of those problems. And, and AgTech is a great example of this because, again, agriculture is boring or was boring. And then people were like, wait a minute, we can use drones to scan the fields and then train on satellite data to improve the, the farmers, you know, uh, what to, so they know when to uh, do their crops, right? And again, like you're like, like that literally can drive billions of dollars of change and improve the farmer's life and make a bunch of money. Uh, but and again, these are the types of problems. They might not be sexy, they, not, they might not be top of mind. But if you can go and find them, if you can go and find those communities that need your help in education, in healthcare, in training, uh, in access, you can really do really cool things. And you don't have to, again, you don't have to be Google to do it, right? You can literally take those off the shelf AI, ML systems, find those unique, interesting data sets, and do some really cool stuff. So, I, and I probably add to this just more so than anything is, is just like the digital divide is, is a problem. Um, and Sanjita, she was talking about the exposure. You look at these extreme events and they sort of expose reality, right? And then it makes it you know, better maybe in some cases and worse, but you see it. That's the one thing. You put stress on a system, you will expose things. And the digital divide was a huge problem during the pandemic because everyone had to go online. And that wasn't just school children, it was families, it was business, it was our workers, our workforce. And it exposed things like, you know, maybe some people take for granted you have a laptop and you, it doesn't apply to you. Um, but other workers don't, like our factories, they don't, they don't do that, right? Our factory production workers don't do that. And, um, and in construction out in the field or the farms or whatever, you know, you, you, you know, this is the concept of, you know, kind of global thinking applied locally, and, and this is that digital divide. I mean, in some senses, technology is, is the number one, is, is it, it's sort of the equalizer of knowledge, right? I mean, it gives access, and that's the most important thing. Um, you know, there's no silver kind of bullet to solve it, but I think the underlying piece, like even with AI, and the important piece um, is the data exposes reality. And they always say you can't improve something you can't measure, right? And so, um, and AI evolved this way too, where, uh, you know, I've mentioned a company we acquired, I looked and it was 2010, and it was satellite-based, it was an AI, as a professor out of Germany, he could interpret satellite-based imagery to figure out, you know, stormwater runoff or perviable, imperviable surfaces, and, and even kind of, you know, vegetation issues where their vegetation might be encroaching a power line, and that could cause a wildfire if you look at that. Um, so all these same answers, you know, these problems they were trying to do, this is 2010, um, but what's changed is that's, that's a, a software system that was trained on only a limited amount of data, right? And it comes back to the data. And now we have startups like, and there's one that I like, it's called rendered.ai. Um, very well funded, but a startup. Um, but they're doing the, the sort of global data set mode, right? I mean, it's now you have access to these data sets if you have access again, and then if you have the, the data quality and the size and the scale, and it's all at scale, you could probably answer these questions better than you would have with the local. We found that out, and the interesting part to me is this sort of next evolution of AI and this next evolution, you know, that some people are calling Industry 5.0, is the data is there in masses. You're collecting masses. You do have to cross the digital divide. You do have to give access. But there's no question the data has proliferated beyond what any normal human being can process in most cases. I was thinking about a simple case of like a, you know, a water meter that wasn't technology and someone would read it every month and send you a bill. And now that thing's sending data every second, your electric meter, right? And, and, and what do you do with that? What problems can you now solve with that data? That's essentially what's happening. And so for me, I'm a big fan. Like I said, I go back to those UN SDGs because they touch on all things I think that matter, the people side, the environmental side, you know, social side, all these concepts around um, diversity, equity, you know, kind of helping make the world a better place. Um, but to do that, I think, you, you know, you need a data set that kind of gives you a reality check, not an opinion, a reality check. And I always said this, this thing is, you know, you know, math, math doesn't lie, you know, basically, and data is data, right? But, you know, you, you need to be able to get that to actually make an interpretation, and then you get into the questions like you said is, you know, the bias of the data and all that kind of thing. But the data um, and the evolution that we're at right now is at a fundamental inflection point uh, in the world of technology, no doubt. Great, thanks so much. 
So as we talk about these things, there's so many things that overlap, but uh, data, you know, we're talking a lot about data. We need data to be able to make good decisions, and we can make bad decisions if the data is bad, you know, garbage in, garbage out. We've had that phrase for a long time. I, I want to move uh, and connect something, a phrase, uh, the Internet of Things. I haven't heard that much, that phrase recently, but, I mean, we're really talking about the Internet of Things, and so I, I know we have things that, Commonly, we talk about smart homes, but also it's, you know, uh, helping with elder care, it's medical monitoring, it's all kinds of other things that we can do. But then I also want to veer into privacy and what other issues there are, because we're talking about helping, having good social impact, et cetera. But, you know, there are a lot of businesses that want to make money as well. I'm not saying that we can't do both at the same time. So maybe some comments on Internet of Things, where some of those things are going that we haven't specifically talked about and maybe getting into privacy. All right, so on, on IoT, I will, um, we have a good kind of perspective. Um, so Trimble, you know, as mentioned, we started as a GPS company, and that was Charlie Trimble, that was before me, so this is like, I didn't invent GPS. Um, so, but Charlie Trimble did, right? He was involved at Hewlett Packard and they invented GPS. And if you think about GPS, what is it? It's IoT, kind of, before the term, right? I mean, there's a satellite, a bunch of satellites cruising around, sending data down to a little instrument telling you your position on the Earth, but you can't get the position without some software, right, to process the signal and then extract the data and, and you know, use it for a decision. Um, so, so early days of IoT, like I said, bringing this stuff together, we've been in that. We've acquired IoT companies. We acquired a little cellular-based um, uh, sensor for water networks, so pressure flow level, alerting you during floods if water's going to come out of the sewers, that kind of thing, um, during hurricanes and all that if they're used for extreme weather events. So we've been in that whole space. IoT was interesting because years ago, um, I think Cisco made the claim it was going to be the kind of the next biggest thing, the next, I forget, the $50 billion market at the time. It surpassed all those expectations. It's almost ubiquitous now, like your ring cams at home and, you know, everything's kind of an IoT device. We actually differentiate um, just general IoT because we're kind of in these industrial markets where I always say it's, it's a little interesting. Tech's always really cool and interesting. But then when you go out in the field to try and build a house or to a farmer or to you know, build a bridge or you know, transportation, we're in autonomy, we do autonomous you know, navigation, we're on the Cadillac Super Cruise, um, things like that. But they're, they're a little bit rugged, dirty environments. They call that the industrial IoT, the IIoT. Um, and that's a little more challenging because it's wet, dirty environments where you have to put technology. The nuances there are uh, a little different than a nice little, you know, home Wi-Fi router. You don't have connectivity in many of these cases, so there's satellite networks, but like for me, IoT um, sort of came and went as a term almost, like, I, like you're saying, like, don't hear it so much. I feel like the hype cycle of IoT sort of came and we're on the, you know, the broad adoption of that. I, I think the, the AI and analytics and, and how to use data uh, for good um, to make better decisions, better outcomes, is really what interests me. The IoT just provides another input point to just do what I said before, which is just inundate us with data, because that's essentially what most IoT systems do, is they're helping solve a problem, but by the way, you're getting orders of magnitude more data than you need to solve that problem. So what can you do? What other problems can you solve with that? Becomes kind of interesting if you can collect it in a way, you know, and I think use it for that purpose. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. The, the new term now is uh, edge AI. So historically, the model is the device gathers the data, sends it back to some central location, and then processes it and you know, does the thinking and then sends it back to the device. Uh, what we're looking at now, we're still doing that, of course, but what we're looking at now is edge AI. So there, there are new chips that have been designed that are uh, energy efficient and uh, can work on smaller data sets and imperfect data and work on the device, on-prem or, or on the actual device itself. And they're doing really interesting stuff around, you know, actually driving, uh, non-connected, non right? So, so now you can actually you know, deploy it in those situations. Um, but there is an interesting thing, though, when, when you're trying to send data back, because this goes to the privacy concept that you were talking about. Uh, different countries and different regions have different regulations as to what the uh, you know, data is doing. So, you know, GDPR is probably the most common thing you've heard. Uh, so, you know, data can't leave the country. So if a large, 
you know, a tech giant is trying to build a big AI model around the world and your data can't leave you know, France or Germany or wherever it, it's being generated, how can you build that model? Th then you'll, that's where you get things like federated learning. So that's something where you can actually try and do AI, uh, but you're not sending the data back, you're sending the, the learnings back. Or it, 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 it trains in country and then like the, you know, the, the non-identifiable data gets sent back. So there, there are really interesting things that are happening there. Uh, and then there's another thing around privacy. Um, and this was interesting when I was doing work with the partnership on AI. Uh, different countries and different cultures have different understanding, understanding what privacy actually is. So if you're in China, right, their understanding of privacy is completely different than Europe and is actually different from the United States. So, you know, facial recognition might be super okay in China or in London, like every you know, street corner has a camera on it, but San Francisco will ban the use of facial recognition by government entities, right? So, where you're working, especially if you join a multinational organization, will significantly affect how you can do business, uh, how you can do business while you know, not breaking the law. Um, and it sometimes hinders you in, when you're trying to do these kind of IoT data is being sent back and forth kind of things. But that's maybe when you do the kind of federated learning stuff or the uh, edge AI concepts that you have as well. Great, thanks. Uh, so this uh, idea of fear of irrelevancy came up, Kala and, and his father, and then that was mentioned uh, on the, the first panel. So I, I want to ask this from a different perspective. So uh, in terms of irrelevance, um, you know, there is certainly a potential for de-skilling of humans in general, but different skills. And, uh, and so one example, of course, is airline pilots who, uh, you know, the, the, fl the, the planes fly themselves basically, and pilots are getting kind of less and less experience on actually how to fly a plane, which, you know, 99% of the time is probably okay, but that 1% is kind of important. Uh, but as, as more and more AI takes over, and, you know, we, I'm not thinking of the singularity or the Jetsons or whatever, but, you know, we're going down a path. Are, are we going to lose some of the experience and skills, and even in this terms of ethical decision-making, as more and more decisions are made or supported by uh, technology, you know, are we losing that ability to, to do the thinking as humans that is so important and uh, innate to us? Um, I just I laugh because, you know, it sort of seems like that's been the trajectory for a long time, <laughs> you know, where, you know, the calculators and tools in college and, and university, I mean, you, you just, automation of things that you have to be trained for. I, I look back and think about, you know, the concept of teaching theory versus applied, um, you know, applications of the, the theory. I'm a huge fan of a proper education. Um, and so, you know, it concerns me a bit because, um, you know, that, that is a trajectory. You have seen that, like I, I was seeing an example in our world is robotics again, uh, in drones. We've, we acquired drone companies, right? And you could say, okay, your, your example of a pilot is a drone, uh, just a big drone with a bunch of us sitting there going to our next you know, meeting. Um, but we have ro robots doing things. Our, our, our workforce, our customers in a large way, like I said with GPS, are the folks standing in the middle of the street surveying. We used to have two people doing it. You had to hold a stick and hold the machine and all this, two people. Then we automated it, got down to one person. Um, we now have a little spot, the robot dog. If you look this thing up from Boston Dynamics Partnership, it, I don't know if you've seen their robot, but it looks like a dog spot. Um, but we put our scanning technology on that thing and you could just cruise around here and create a full 3D model of this room in like, you know, a couple minutes, you know, and so, yeah, we, we need someone guiding. There's still a, a human involved in doing that stuff, but you're seeing it basically go away. Um, and you're seeing the AI, like I said, going back to the data and the analy volumes of data. Can you do it better, faster, cheaper? Yes, I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna disrupt the economies, the traditional kind of workforce that way. I think the workforce conversation is the best at the university because if you're in this room um, and you're studying any of this stuff, uh, you're in a good place because what's happening now is you're seeing a disruption of the traditional workforce in a lot of those categories and opportunities that we can't fill for the new categories and what's happened very quickly is that shift so you know you might think oh time it takes time for some of these technologies but you guys have all seen this I mean you've seen the the adoption rates of new technologies just skyrocket in the past they took mega years to 
to adopt. And now you just, boom, it's adopted. So that's where we are right now. It's been adopted. We have big data. We have big systems. Many of them are making bad decisions. And we need people to help make better decisions, have point those systems in the right direction to get better outcomes, right? I mean, it's all about better outcomes. But if you don't have the workforce, to do it, and I think that's my biggest concern. We, you know, we have an initiative, I didn't mention this before, but I did say I'm involved in universities. So yes, I'm on the Board of Regents here. I'm on the Seaver College with Tina Cho, her executive chair, I, I love helping the university here. Uh, science engineering is really important. And at UCLA, and then we have 27 universities around the world where we put tech labs in. We're in Sao Paulo, Brazil, we're in Edinburgh, Scotland, we're, you know, we're all over trying to push technology, give it away. Um, and help with the students in the next gen. And we own a company called SketchUp, which goes down into K through 12. Um, so we're, we're helping like K through, we're trying to create a pipeline. We're, we're going into the HBCUs, we're going into underserved communities, into uh, you know, kind of work skills, not necessarily university program, but skills and trades um, to create more workers that can use these new tools. Because fundamentally that is the problem right now. And as you project out the future, I think, the comment was the workforce is um, retiring, so it gets worse. Like if you model it out, it gets worse unless we get more skills in here. So, um, you know, you guys are in a good spot. Going back to the, you know, what is ML and what is machine learning, systems are really good at doing things that involve pattern recognition, right? So if it's a, a, a job that is repetitive, then robots have either already re replaced it, you know, AI has already replaced it, or will re replace it soon. And that also includes things like software development, by the way. Like, uh, there are, there's research being done currently around, like, auto ML models that can code just as well as actual coders, right? Because it's a repetitive job, right? It's a pattern recognition job. Now, does that mean that everyone's going to be out of a job? No, I mean, we have a worker shortage right now. What happens is the, the work changes, right? You go from horse and buggy to car to, I don't know, teleportation, but, but constantly like the, there will always be a requirement for humans to actually do work. It's just that, to your point, the nature of the work is changing, and as a society, we have to kind of grasp this concept of being a lifelong learner, right, or a, a life, lifelong skill acquirer, right? You know, I'm sure our grandparents did one job, they were like you know, farmers or whatever, for their entire life, so the skill set never changed. I, you, know, you and I have already probably changed jobs like two or three times, and like I'm sure our kids are going to change it 20 times, right? So, this concept of you know AI will take the jobs is incorrect. AI will change jobs. AI will will eliminate like pools of jobs, right? Maybe maybe truck driver goes away, but then there is going to be an entire new class of job that goes on top of that that we haven't even thought about that will be required to be trained and and done. So. That, that's the way I see it going. Now, is it going to be a smooth transition? Probably not. Like, just look back on human history. Like, there's always been those, you know, troubling times when you go from one industrial norm to another, right? Um, but, but it'll settle down. It's just hopefully, can we make that as smooth as possible and as fast as possible? And hopefully, as a, as a, as a world, we've matured. But I'm, I'm not sure if we have. <laughs> Great. I, I know we're out about, about out of time. So as a professor, I'm going to just make one comment as a professor at LMU is that we, and, and uh, Chris experienced this at LMU, it's not just about learning, uh, you know, a skill, but it's, it's learning, you know, that liberal arts education background, thinking in the bigger things, being able to think about uh, all kinds of things in terms of society and other things. So I think we're on the right track. Doesn't mean it's easy to do this because we're always balancing, you know, skills versus that thought process. But uh, I think this is tells us that we're not all going to be out of jobs, but we also have to be nimble. We have to be thinkers. We have to use those skills. And I, I know that some people, even uh, from LMU, still say, "Oh, you know, it was that philosophy course that really helped me because I can really think through things rather than just that, those that skill set." And I think the business school often is. Um, you know, accused of teaching those skills, but in fact, I know that at LMU, at least, we're, we're trying to get many of those broader thinking things and those values and those ethics along with it, which is also one of our topics here well, today. Well, on that note, I'd echo, I'd, I'd echo that, because I was thinking about this. I had, you know, I had to take ethics and philosophy, and, um, and I came back and talked to students a long time ago, engineering ethics, and I had all these examples of people getting arrested, you know, the mayor of San Francisco back in the day, the guy, the mayor of San Diego. There's all sorts of 
examples of, of bad decisions. I think the end of today, the speaker is going to talk about some real ethical challenges. But I will say the one unique thing for LMU, because like I said, then my exposure to other universities and all these kinds of conversations, everything, LMU does have that in its DNA, right? I mean, there is some values and philosophy here at LMU that um, I think it's important. That's to me what differentiates an LMU student. Um, in your career. So uh, the challenge to you is to apply that, right? It's not to do, just go do something, it's to actually do it with purpose, right? And that's what I think LMU tries to teach you, um, hopefully effectively, and that differentiates you. And I will tell you that differentiates you in a very significant way. If you can come at your next kind of plan with your next job and you interview, you know, and you have some purpose in mind, we say AI for good, right? I mean, that's what you were working on. It wasn't AI to do AI. It's interesting to see if we can actually help solve some of these challenges like the UN SDGs. I think it's just a framework that motivates, and um, I think you guys are in a good shape just because of that as well. Thanks. So I think that's a perfect ending to this uh, panel session. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Nima. And thanks, Sumjita, who's uh, had to leave. So I think we're going to take a break now. Yep. And thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>